MZ TV. This is MZ TV, your home for encouraging words and sensible sayings when perilous periods are present. And perilous periods are definitely present. I am Mark Zender, your host, holding court in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which I call the edge of the bottom of the Floridan Peninsula, or the edge of the bottom of everything. That's basically where I operate. I am going to dedicate one show to telling you again one of the greatest truths in the scripture, and that is the fact that Jesus Christ, our Savior, voluntarily entered into our estate to save us from sin and death. He did it voluntarily. He forsook his high estate. I mean, I know there was a big controversy about this a while ago. And some people might say, just let it go. But uh, how can I let go of the truth? This is, the more I think about it, this is such a great truth. And it is more appalling to me than ever that anyone would deny this truth. And I'm not going to get into details in the denials. Uh, I'm not going to get into details of the denials because it's just uh, absurd. But for new listeners, new viewers, um, if you hear any whiff or hint that Jesus Christ did not pre-exist his birth in Bethlehem, run away from it. It is diabolical it's a lie there are three people pushing this peter may clyde pilkington and aaron welch and i don't know how anybody could push this saying that jesus christ accidentally found himself as a baby peter may says that he was jesus christ was 100 percent human zero percent divine yep that's what some are saying in our camps i'm revisiting this again because the departure from faith shocks me and the truth shocks me just as much that jesus christ would give up everything for us and we see the parallel in adam the reason i'm on this again for one show is that why am i even why am i apologizing this is so important i sent out a saturday classic on saturday I don't know if everybody got the email. Some people aren't signed up for my emails. I don't know why. If you're not, please sign up. Go to martinzender.com and there, scroll down a little bit on the right-hand side, you will see sign up. You sign up and then you get a couple free gifts, some literature that you can't get anywhere else. And you also are on our email list then, so... If anything crazy happens to me on YouTube or you wonder where's Zender, you will get emails from headquarters. Uh, stay in touch. And another bonus for signing up is on Saturdays, I run a classic. Well, I just happen to be looking through my videos. Usually my sister picks out the classics. And I mean, there's so many classics. You basically just throw a dart and you land on a classic. But this one, I watched it again and I was just, my heart was full of my love for my Savior, Jesus Christ, in voluntarily entering into our realm, partaking of our sorry, sad estate in order to rescue us out of it. He was not fully man. He's not fully God. He's the Son of God. But he is certainly not 100% human, 0% divine, as Peter May says he is. And these other gentlemen, Clyde Pilkington and Aaron Welch, denying that Jesus Christ emptied himself and took the form of humanity, denying it, twisting scripture to teach something else. It's just more disgusting to me than ever. The Saturday special, I'm going to link it down here again. It is MCTV 1270. I encourage everybody to watch it. After you watch this video, go down Hit that little tab that says show more and you'll see a link to MZTB1270. That video is called Disturbing Revelation Ahead. Viewer discretion is advised. That's the name of the video. I want people to see it all over again so that people can be extra aware of the lie and also super sensitive and appreciative of the truth 
The main thing here is the truth that Jesus Christ voluntarily entered into our estate. This is a sacrifice right up there with going to the cross. In fact, his two-part humiliation is documented for us. For those new to the channel, our Lord did two separate things in saving us from sin and death. I'm in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Let this disposition be in you which is in Christ Jesus also. This is the disposition Paul wants to be in us. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be service-minded when it comes to other people. All people, especially the family of faith, but we're to be good to all people. Let this disposition be in you, which is in Christ Jesus also, who being inherently in the form of God, that's what he was before he came to earth deems it not pillaging, that is, robbery, to be equal with God. This doesn't mean he is God. In fact, the word equal denies the possibility that he could be the same as God because an equal sign demands two different sides. Something cannot be equal to itself, in other words. Deems it not robbery to be equal with God. Nevertheless, empties himself, taking the form of a slave, coming to be in the likeness of humanity. That was an amazing sacrifice. But then this. And being found in fashion as a human, he wasn't found in fashion as an Adamic human before he came into our world. He was at the right hand of God. He was in the form of God. Verse 6, Philippians 2. He humbles himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So this is a two part service of Christ to us. Two different words used here. Paul says he emptied himself and he humbled himself. Emptying himself has to do with coming into our world voluntarily from the high heaven, from the right hand of God, and humbling himself refers to after being found in fashion as a human. See, he had to come into fashion that is, look like a human being, be, have the same number of arms, same number of legs as an Adamic human being so that he could be crucified. As the Son of God, in the form of God, you can't crucify him in that state. And evil could rightly say, or Satan could rightly say, well, you know, of course, it's not a fair fight. You're the almighty Son of God. It's not a fair fight. I'm only Satan, but if you were to lower yourself. No, it wasn't Satan's idea. It wasn't Satan's idea. Why would it be? Why would it be? God is in the business of shutting every mouth. And if God conquered evil by his great power, by thunder and lightning bolts, and, and by just using his almightiness as God to banish Satan, to destroy the adversary, I, we would see God's power, yes, but we wouldn't see his heart. We wouldn't see the power of spirit. We, would see, we wouldn't see the power of humility, the power of, ah, it's so hard to put this into words. It was, it was much more effective to fight Satan since we're so preoccupied with flesh, humans are, we're so preoccupied with strength in the flesh. We go to the gym, we work out, we want to have lots of money, we buy powerful cars, we just, we want to dress nice and everything in the flesh, everything in the flesh. And for God to demonstrate, you can't come up with a better demonstration of the nothingness, the worthlessness of flesh than by Christ fighting Satan in the weakest possible place and in the most absurdly helpless way, which is pinned to a Roman stake of execution. It is from there, from the weakest place, the most helpless place that he conquered Satan. This proves to you that evil is not conquered by fleshly might by fleshly strength not even the uber strength of god but it's conquered by the power of spirit alone and jesus christ being full of the spirit of god conquered 
evil from the hill called Calvary. And that just stuns us when we see that. And every mouth is barred. Every mouth is shut up at that point. It's why we always see in Scripture God making people weak first and then conquering, reducing Gideon's army, going after Goliath with a 12-year-old boy in a slingshot, going after Satan while on a cross not even able to swat the flies from your face. See, God's always doing that to show the power of spirit over what we would consider to be might. And that invites us to be humble. This is why Paul says, let this disposition be in you, which is in Christ Jesus also. So when Christ Jesus left the right hand of God, as he himself said, the glory I had with you before the world was, speaking of his father, it was his disposition. He wanted to do it. He was disposed to doing this. Let this disposition, Paul says, be in you, which is in Christ Jesus also. Christ Jesus had a disposition. If he didn't exist beforehand, how could he have any kind of disposition? But his disposition was to come here. To You can't imagine. It would be like you becoming an ant. Can you imagine somebody telling you that you have to become an ant for 30 years? Bid my ants don't live for 30 years. Yeah, but you're going to be an amazing ant. You've been condemned to live 30 years as an ant, and you're going to go down into the ant world, and you're going to be reduced from your present body, your present power, your present size. You're going to be reduced to the size of an ant, and you're going to be among ants, but you have the wisdom of a human being. You have the knowledge of a human being. I know sometimes we know ants have more wisdom than human beings. I understand that. But roll with me. How many would volunteer for that? To save the ants? It's going to save the ants. The ants need saved. Or, but that's not even a good analogy. It's worse than an ant. An ant is a greatly intelligent creature. A piece of plankton. Save the world of plankton. Become a plankton. It's just unimaginable. And to say that that never happened, to say that Christ had no disposition whatsoever, I'm not going to dwell on the opponents of this great truth. But in this video, I'm going to get to Adam in a second. But in this video, I'm recommending to you, which is linked below. Watch it again. MZTV 1270, disturbing revelation ahead. Viewer discretion is advised. David, King David. 1,000 years before Christ comes on the scene, calls Jesus Christ his Lord. I'm not going to go into detail now because I do it in the video, but in Psalm 110, we have a curious saying. David says in Psalm 110, verse 1, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I shall make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The common versions say, the Lord said to my Lord, and I always read that, said, what the heck does that mean? That doesn't make any sense. But the concordant version has Yahweh said to my Lord. So we have God in Christ, Yahweh, the name of God, my Lord being Christ. So David has a Lord way back when, millennia before Christ shows up. How does he have a Lord unless he pre-existed? And the Pharisees asked him about this very thing in Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. Check that out for yourself. Jesus says to Christ, whose son is he? Well, they said he's David's son. Well, how then is David, if he's David's son, only how is it that David calls him Lord? This was nothing less than a teaching on his preexistence, that he was so great that David called him Lord. And he was so present in David's time before his incarnation on the earth that David called him Lord. I get into detail on this in that video. And also... The challenge of the Pharisees, when Jesus says that, Jesus tells them, in John 8, verses 48 through 59, before Abraham was, I am. And they mocked him. They couldn't believe it. It was the most incredible thing he said. And they said, you are not yet 50 years old. How can you say before Abraham was, I am? They understood what he was saying, that before Abraham was, I existed. I existed before Abraham existed. If that doesn't prove the pre-existence of Christ, 
what does? And the opponents of this truth actually take the argument of the Pharisees. He's not, not even 50 years old. That's what they're saying. They're actually arguing the argument of the Pharisees. You're not even, he's not even 50 years old, they tell us. Peter May tells us. Clyde Pilkington tells us. Aaron Welch tells us. He's not even 50 years old. How could he exist before Abraham? They're aligning with the Pharisees. In the video, MCTV 1270, Disturbing Revelation Ahead, viewer discretion is advised. I call the opponents of this truth Tories. I do that because of the acronym T-O-R-I, made this up myself, Trinity Over Reactors. These three people and others who have fallen into this false teaching, they overreact to the Trinity. They hate the Trinity so much, and the Trinity is a false teaching that they've gone too far. They've overreacted. And in order to take the plank, the platform away from the Trinitarians who obviously need the pre-existence of Christ to prove their point, they've taken away the pre-existence of Christ completely. And in my opinion, have invented a teaching that's just about worse than the Trinity. You don't need to do away with the pre-existence of Christ to undo the Trinity. Christ still came out of God. He's the firstborn of all creation. He's the image of the invisible God. So you don't need, you don't need to do away with the pre-existence of Christ. You still can't prove the Trinity. Christ is still the firstborn of all creation. He still came out of God. He still is not God. He's still the Son of God as he claimed to be. By the way, quickly, get to get into the Trinity thing. You know, if Jesus Christ had ever claimed to be God, that would have been used at his trial. At his trial, it was a sham of a trial. There was many things illegal about it. The time of day it was done, or they didn't have enough witnesses, and it, it was a sham trial. So if they would have brought, they could have brought any lie against him to make it sound as bad as they could. But what was the worst thing they could say about him? This man says he is God's son. And that's what Jesus' claim was throughout his life. I'm the son of God, God's son. Don't you think that if Jesus Christ had at any time said, I am God, that that would have been exhibit A at his trial? This man says he's God. No, but the worst they could think of was this man says he's the son of God. If Jesus Christ, and that's exactly what he was. If Jesus Christ had ever said he was God, which he didn't, he's, he has a God. <laughs> Paul uses this phrase often the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ has a God and Father. In 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 14, we get an amazing truth. I know I've said this before, but I am on fire for this again. One show, it's all I'm going to do. I know I exposed the falsehood. Not going to do that again. Well, yeah, I guess I'm doing it a little bit again, but good, good, good. It needs thoroughly and harshly exposed because it's a slap in the face to christ and i pray that these men who are forwarding this light will repent of it see the truth change your mind i would like them the three people i named to watch mztv 1270 sit down relax try to have an open mind to me, I give irrefutable evidence. I mean, it's so easy to find evidence. It's so easy. It's so easy. It's really difficult to try to twist Scripture to make it so that Jesus Christ did not exist until his birth in, in Bethlehem. That's the hard part. Oh, do they work hard to do that. You would think it would bother them that they have not one verse proving their contention. You would think it would bother. It would bother me. If I, if I held a scriptural uh, position and I didn't have one verse supporting my position, ah, I'd be a little shaky on that position. I think I would have to ask myself, hmm, maybe I have the wrong position. I've challenged one of the brethren who believes this to give, please give me one verse supporting your contention that Jesus Christ did not exist before slipping out of his mommy's belly in Bethlehem and he said to me well I can't do it right now I'm busy well he's still busy that was 
a half a year ago. Still busy. Because there is no verse. They have to sew together different parts of Scripture, sew together different parts illicitly to create a Frankenstein monster of deception. And that's what has been done here, ladies and gentlemen. And I want you to resist it. If you hear of it, resist it. So, um, 1 Timothy 2, verse 14. Adam was not seduced. This is the amazing thing. Adam was not seduced, yet the woman being deluded has come to be in the transgression. I apologize to all women listening to this. But uh, Eve was the one deceived. Adam was not deceived. You may say, well, if the serpent had approached Adam first, maybe Adam would have been deceived. Eh, maybe, maybe not. But women are known, rightly so, for being more emotional, more understanding, more empathetic, more, well, I think we need to listen to the serpent. He's a nice creature. He looks very nice over here. See, women are more apt to do that. Men are more cynical, which is not necessarily a great thing to say about a man, that he's cynical. Uh, the scripture, I think this is beautiful. Scripture calls Eve innocent, and that's it. It was her innocent heart. You would not want to send, send an innocent person to the used car lot to negotiate your deal for a car. You just wouldn't want to do it. You want to send a cynic, a hard-ass somebody who just questions everything, who doesn't believe anybody. That's the kind of guy I want negotiating a deal at the used car lot. So there's a reason Satan approached the woman. Nothing against women. They're just too good for the eon. They're innocent. They're pure. They're too good. They're too pure. They're too innocent for the eon. It's a wicked eon. And whenever you're dealing with evil, women should just sit down and be safe and be quiet. That's why Paul wanted women to be quiet. Not because they're not able to teach the word of God. Is that they're too precious to waste. This is an evil eon. And we waste men fighting Satan, not women. Women are to be protected. And again, they're suited for the next eon, which is a more pure eon. And this eon, they're too good for it. They're too good for it. But anyway, Eve was deceived. And what does this tell us? Why does Paul point out to us that Adam was not seduced, but the woman being deluded has come to be in the transgression? Because Adam voluntarily joined his wife. Eve partook of the fruit, and God said, On the day you eat of it, to die you shall be dying. And Eve ate of it before Adam did. And the second Eve partook of that fruit. She became mortal. She became a sinner, and she 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 committed a sin and became mortal at that point. And she was a dying creature. Think of this: her husband was not yet any of that. He was good. He was untainted. He was still, you might say, immortal, still without sin. And yet his wife comes up to him and uh, tells him this terrible thing. And I, his first words might have been, what? You did what? You did what? Slow down. You did what? Satan told you what? You said what? Adam voluntarily joined his wife. And the husband in a godly marriage is responsible. This is why as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Adam is the one responsible, even though he wasn't seduced. It says right here in 1 Timothy 2, 14. Yet in Adam, see, he's the one responsible. Men in a godly marriage in an Ephesian five marriage you're you're responsible doesn't matter what your wife does you answer to god you answer to god but adam this is the beautiful thing adam because of the love he had for his wife he knew what he was doing he knew what he was partaking in. he knew it but he didn't want her to be alone in it and plus god had told him to be fruitful and multiply you can't do that when eve is on the other side of the iron curtain of sin and death and in this, Adam is a type of Christ because Christ voluntarily entered into this sick, degenerate, degraded realm for our sakes. And he did it knowingly. He did it voluntarily. The Tories, the Trinity over reactors, 
they make, in this, they make Adam more loving, greater than Christ. Christ never wanted to come down here, according to them. He just found himself in this predicament. 100% humans, 0% divine, according to Peter May. He just found himself in the, the predicament. He didn't want to do it. I never would have done this if they interviewed him at age 12. Uh, was it your intention, sir, to come down to the earth and to disappoint your parents and to start teaching the elders in the temple uh, so that your parents can't find you? No, I never wanted to do this. This was forced upon me. I just woke up one day, read the scriptures, realized it was about me. I said, oh, no. No, he said, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. How can words be plainer? And how can it be any plainer that just as Adam sacrificed willingly to be with his wife, thus Jesus Christ sacrificed willingly to be with his creation. Yes, his creation, because all is out of God, but all is created through Christ. Jesus Christ came to join his creation. He became among his creation to rescue it from sin and death. And in this, he is greater than Adam. He's certainly not less than Adam. He's greater than Adam. 